The camera on the drone caught or captured an idyllic scene. Uh, there was a young man playing in the waters of uh, crystal clear waters of a tropical paradise. And uh, you could see as the drone began to ascend a little bit and the camera started to pan out that he was with his family, there were children in the water, and then there were other families that were gathered there. And as the drone continued to back up and get farther and farther away, you could see this just beautiful tropical paradise where these people were enjoying a lovely day at the beach. Beautiful sunny day, warm weather, nothing like today at all for us here. But as the camera continued to pan out, a shadowy form could be seen underneath the crystal clear waters. And it was the unmistakable shape of an ancient and deadly terror, a great white shark. And those of us who grew up in the days of Jaws a number of years ago know what that feeling is like. Just call out shark at any kind of a beach and just watch what kind of... Actually, don't do that, please, because you'll cause people to panic. Uh, my youngest daughter is attending uh, Hillsong College right now in Sydney, Australia, and she has been wanting to surf for so many years, and now she has the opportunity. But a number of years ago, she watched the movie, you may be familiar with it, Soul Surfer which was of a champion, a young lady, a surfer, who lost her arm to a, a shark attack. Uh, the movie was Bethany Hamilton was the young lady. And so Angela has taken lots of pictures of surfboards and of beaches and other sorts of things there in Australia, but she has yet to go into the water because of that. And we know what that is like. That is something that can also uh, be... Uh, on our minds if we go to such a place. But similarly, there is an ancient and deadly terror lurking below the surface of our existence as well. Death. And uh, how do we know that it is there? We know it because people keep vanishing. Right? And the bodies and the blood are in the water. Right now, the current rate of, of death for or mortality for the human race is at 100%, isn't it? And it's a fearful, it's a universal, and it's an inescapable prospect. So how can we escape from the monster lurking below? Well, that is what Good Friday is all about. Uh, it's how we can escape from this lurking monster and know that there is a hope beyond it, that there is something to look forward to beyond it, and we don't have to fear this monster anymore. Now, some of you I know are here this morning because your mom made you come, or grandma and grandpa asked you to be here, and we want, to know that if, we want you to know that we are super glad that you are here. Uh, if you only come to church on uh, Christmas time or at the Easter season, uh, the good news is that you're going to hear the real foundation of what it is that we believe about Jesus Christ. This is kind of the core of what we believe. If you can put together Christmas and Easter, this is the good news that we have to proclaim as Christians into our world. So we're glad you're here, and we hope to make it worth your while as we get into the scriptures together and try to understand what Good Friday is all about. And here's what I want you to understand, that the Easter season is all about the death of all deaths. The death of, of all deaths. And let me explain by reading a portion of Scripture to you. If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there are pew Bibles just in front of you. I picked up one myself because I'm getting to that stage of age where I need a little larger print. And this one's uh, bigger than mine. It's page 1002, if you need to know where the passage is. And I remind you, this is the Word of God, and so we want to respect it and listen to it and read it here together as a church family. Follow along, please, as I read Hebrews chapter 2, starting at verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood... He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. 
For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is a rather dense and weighty passage of Scripture, so let me skim along the surface just a little bit to hit a few of the highlights. The first three verses tell us or call us to celebrate Jesus' victory over death, to celebrate Jesus' victory over death. Good Friday commemorates Christ's death on the cross. That is why we are worshiping today. That's why we have gathered here today to reflect upon, and that's why we have these symbols in front of us, to reflect upon Christ's death and its significance for us. But how can that death be good? We call this Good Friday, but it's about a death. How does that go together? It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It is good, however, as you see from this text, it is good because of what that death accomplished, what the results were because of this death. This message that is being shared here was written for a suffering and fearful people. As you see in the text here, it says, therefore, there's a the word therefore. Whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you need to look backwards to see what was in the context. And this author is writing. We're not sure who the author was who wrote this book. But the author is writing to a group of probably Jewish Christians who had left the old way of life and were following Jesus. And because of that, were starting to suffer for their faith. They were being persecuted. They were being bullied. They were being hurt. And the prevailing culture was turning against them. Does that sound a little bit contemporary for us today? The culture was going in another direction. And these people were struggling, and they were starting to think, well, maybe we should go back to the old way of life. Maybe following Jesus is too difficult. Maybe we should just leave, get away from the pressure and go back to the old way of life. And the author is writing them and saying, listen, don't go back. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. Jesus is greater. You're going in a better direction. Don't give up. Don't abandon your faith. And the writer's encouraging the persevere, and he's using Jesus' example to encourage them and to challenge them to stay faithful and stay the course. And he makes the comment in the early part of chapter 1 that Jesus, God's Son, is the final and complete revelation of God to us. We don't need anything more. He is it. He is everything. That's why we've celebrated him. That's why we've worshipped him today because he is the center of all of our worship and hopes and dreams. In Jesus, God came near and entered fully into human existence. And because of that, it means that he understands us. He's been where we are and he knows what it's like to go through all the ups and downs and struggles and difficulties of life. He understands, he can sympathize, and we know that we are now not alone. We are not forgotten. We are not of no consequence. We matter. So in this text you'll see here, the first part of verse 14, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, who's the he, referring back to Jesus, you see that in verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. First time Jesus' name appears in the book. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, that he might fully experience death for everyone. So going back to verse 14, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He took on flesh and blood. Literally in the text is blood and flesh. That's how they would say it in those days. And in our contemporary world, we talk about flesh and blood. But he took these things on. And what that is talking about basically is the Christmas story that we celebrate every year in December when God became flesh and came and dwelt among us. One of the names that we celebrate is Emmanuel, God with us. 
It's one of the most beautiful names, I think, of our Savior. And Christmas and Easter are inseparably linked. The passage, the passage says since is looking forward to what's going to come ahead. The children he's talking about are us as people, humanity. We are the children he's referring to. And blood and flesh, description of what it means to be a human being. At Christmas time, Jesus became like us. That is a profound truth because then he knows and understands what it's like to be us. Why did Jesus become blood and flesh? This passage tells us two profound reasons why Jesus became flesh. And I'm sure over the Holy Week, many of you have been doing some readings, maybe going through the, the gospel stories portraying the death and burial of, of Christ. And we know that it was a horrific story, right? Right? I mean, it's gruesome, it's ugly, it's terrible. The, the, the worst of humanity was on display. And that is very much so, and we're going to remember the death of Christ by looking at these symbols here this morning. But we need to understand that although it looked like a travesty of justice at the time, and it was, especially from our human standpoint, we need to understand that there was something else going on behind the scenes. And here... A couple of decades later, after Jesus' life on earth, these, these writers are reflecting, the early Christians are reflecting upon well, what actually happened when Jesus died on the cross. And that's what we're getting here. We're not concentrating so much on the, the details, as, as important as those things are, but what was the purpose and plan behind it? Was there a purpose and plan behind it? And we're finding out that there actually was this plan. How did Jesus accomplish this plan? Well, it was through his death. That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the, de the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It was through, the, the means was the death of Christ. This is what, what he did. Dying on the cross, he accomplished a number of things. And two things are highlighted in this text. First of all, in verse 14, to destroy the devil and death to deal with the monster lurking below. That's why Jesus came. Talks about the, the, the one who has the power of death, namely the devil. The devil being the slanderer, the adversary, the accuser of, of people. Uh, Jesus calls him a liar, a thief, and a murderer. And Jesus himself, all the apostles, the early church, and Christians throughout church history who have been faithful to God's word, have looked upon the devil or Satan as being a very, very real being. Not one to be trifled with. He is a reality that we need to be aware of. And he's not some kind of a caricature that we often see portrayed in Hollywood. Scriptures seem to indicate that he was actually a beautiful creature. And if he were to suddenly show up here, we would be tempted to worship him because of his beauty. And that's what makes him so very, very deadly. And if you don't believe that the devil exists, then you're the next item on his menu. You have to respect and be careful of who he is. Now, he says in this text that Jesus came and he died on the cross to destroy the one who had the power of death. This does not mean that Satan ceases to exist. He does continue to exist. But the word destroy there has the idea of render, uh, render inoperative or to make... Uh, to make ineffective. He continues to exist, but death now longer, no longer is a hopeless end. Death now, for those who are trusting Christ, is now, in fact, a doorway, a passageway into something even richer and even better, something to look forward to. Not that we want to go through the experience of death, but what lies beyond is now lo no longer a mystery. Satan is a defeated foe, and he lost his power at the cross of Christ. He thought he had won. He had actually lost. And I believe for all of eternity, Satan will bang his head against the wall in frustration, the most frustrated being in all of eternity, because what he thought was his victory was exactly what God used to accomplish his destruction. G, uh, Satan is a defeated foe. He lost his power. And secondly, then also Jesus delivered, came to deliver those enslaved by fear 
of death, to deliver those who through fear of death were subject to this lifelong slavery. Fear is a, faithful, is a fearful prospect for all of us, isn't it? I mean, we don't know the timing of it. Unless we're facing execution, we don't know what the day is that we're going to pass from this life. We don't know the circumstances of it. And we don't know what perhaps lies beyond. For many people, there's no real surety of, uh, assurance of what lies beyond. We have an entire profession, the medical profession, that tries to help us live as long as possible and somehow cheat death. But it always ends up in, ultimately in failure because we do pass on. Fear of death can hold us in bondage. Lifelong slavery, this passage talks about. But Jesus faced death for us as one of us. Jesus faced death as us, before us, as one of us. In a very real sense, his death was the death of all deaths. And I mean that kind of in the superlative, the greatest form. The death. Just like we say the king of all kings, the lord of all lords, his death was, was the death of all deaths, the greatest death. He faced death and defeated it so we could be delivered from our fears. Well, who are the ones who benefit from Jesus' victory? Who are the beneficiaries? This text goes on to tell us in verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And we suddenly see something a little bit more cosmic that's going on behind the scenes that we don't always pick up here just on this earth. He, his mission was to help people. He had to become human in order to take hold of us, literally take hold of us, to hold on to us or to help us or to show divine concern for us. But we find here that there is no salvation, no redemption, no restoration for angels. People can be redeemed, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we're better, but for some reason, God chose in his grace and in his love to give us another opportunity to have Jesus come and die for us. Jesus never came and died for angels. The fallen angels, the ones who rebelled with Satan and went astray, there is no opportunity for them. That's a cause for celebration. And it's nothing because of who we are or how great we are or whether we deserve it. It's but the grace of God. And that's why we celebrate we celebrate Jesus' victory over death. The monster is lurking below, a great white shark, but you need to know that that shark has been captured. That shark has been captured and it is, a, it is in a large steel cage, so to speak. Now, uh, it's a very large cage, he has lots of influence, but he can't get out of that, he is in there. That's why Jesus came. The problem is too many people try to swim near the cage or they try to swim in the cage thinking they can play games with the shark or they can tame him or they can just pretend he's not there and it won't make any difference, right? And what happens? The body and the blood is in the water and it's gruesome tail. We've got to stay out, got to stay away from that cage. So we celebrate Jesus' death over uh, victory over death. And that's what Good Friday is all about, the celebration of the devil's defeat. So what? So what difference then does this make for our lives today? What is the significance for, of, his, of his death? Well, secondly, the last two verses of this paragraph that I read for us tells us this, that we can find courage. We can find courage in Jesus' sacrifice. In verse 17, we see the necessity of Jesus' humanity. He had to become human in order to rescue us. Notice it says that. He had to be. That word had is the idea of, um, it comes from a word that means to owe somebody or to be obliged. Now, God is, doesn't owe us anything. But for Jesus to complete his mission, he had to become human in order to die for us. It was absolutely necessary and part of the plan. It could not be an animal to be our substitute. And that's what the rest of the book of Hebrews is all about, that the animal sacrifices were pointing ahead to Jesus, but he's the ultimate fulfillment. But an animal couldn't die in our place. An angel could not come and die in our place. Michael or Gabriel or whatever other angels are out there 
could not come and die for us because they are of a different being than us. It couldn't be an alien, even if they exist. Whether they do, they don't. It couldn't be an alien. It had to be a human to die on that cross for us. And Jesus was in every respect, apart from a sin nature, apart from a sin nature, he was fully God and fully human as well. And that was absolutely necessary because God, by his very nature, cannot die. He is the eternal living one. Life is in him, and he cannot die. But Jesus taking on humanity meant that he was able to die in our place in our, on the cross. And because he was God, he could die for an infinite number of people throughout all of human history to our own day and beyond. Why is this significant? And Jesus sacrificed himself for us, and it meant that he could become our merciful and faithful high priest. What does a priest do? A priest offers up sacrifices, right? Represents the people before God, offers up those sacrifices to be acceptable before God. And Jesus acts as our high priest, as the mediator between God and man. He is the one who is able to represent God as the holy God, but he can also represent us as unholy people and bring reconcil reconciliation between us and God. He's the holy, uh, the only mediator between God and man. He is merciful, meaning that he is able to extend God's mercy to us. We so desperately need God's mercy in our lives to withhold his wrath against our sin. So he is able to withhold his righteous judgment upon us but he was also a faithful high priest, meaning that he completely fulfilled his responsibilities before the Father. Jesus completed his mission fully and completely for us. And because of that, he was able to completely remove our sins forever. You caught, I'm sure, the 99-cent word in the passage, propitiation. How often have you used the word propitiation this past week? Right, yeah, yeah, what in the world does that word mean? It's a, it is a great word, it's a powerful word, word, but we don't tend to use it very often. But propitiation has the idea of removing our sins from us, and because our sins have been removed from us, God can look on us and be satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus. It is enough. It has paid the penalty. Our sins have been removed we are now forgiven. God has been propitiated. He is satisfied with the sacrifice. That is good news. That's why Good Friday is so important because our sins, the basis for our, our forgiveness of sins has been accomplished. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And it was a term that in those days would be used to say paid in full. It was a commercial term. You know when you've paid something off and somebody stamps it paid in full? That's what that term meant. Paid in full. And God's wrath against sin has been fully satisfied and is now God. Gone. God isn't angry with you. Your sins have been paid for in Jesus. Jesus took his wrath upon himself so that God's wrath would not need to be poured out upon us. And in a very real sense, Jesus' death was the death of all deaths. His death was the death of all deaths, the greatest example of a death. But what it accomplished was the death of all deaths, that there is forgiveness for all of us. And because of that, where this passage is going is verse 18. For because he, Jesus himself, has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus understands us. And he is able to come to our aid to help us in our time of difficulty. When we're tempted to turn away, when we're tempted to struggle, when life gets difficult, when things aren't turning out the way we had hoped, when our dreams seem to be dashed, when we're facing things like the monster lurking below, there is one who can help us. There's one that we can turn to. And we know that he understands. We know that he cares. He has shown incredible love for us. He has come near 
and he has come to our aid. There is nothing more that God could have possibly done for us than to send his very best, his only begotten son from heaven to die on the cross for our sins. There's nothing more that he could have done to show his great love for us. What more could, could possibly be done to give his life for us? And that's why we've worshiped this morning. That's why we focused in upon Jesus and his sacrifice and why we're going to gather around this table for a few moments, just reflecting again upon what Jesus' death accomplished. It was, it was a travesty of justice, and from a human standpoint, it was horrific. But it was purpose, purposeful. It was part of the plan to accomplish our forgiveness. So find courage in Jesus' sacrifice. Find courage and hope in the midst of your struggles and difficulties. So why is Good Friday significant? We've come together today to celebrate Jesus' victory over death. Death is not the final word. The evil one... It's empty threats. For those who are trusting Christ, empty threats. There's nothing to fear. And we can find courage in Jesus' sacrifice as we go through this life and the difficulties and challenges we face to know that he is near and he will help us. So there's a monster lurking below and the bodies and the blood are in the water as evidence. And so what can be done? Well, imagine again that same drone taking the picture, panning out a little farther, and suddenly into the frame comes a Coast Guard helicopter. And on there are some servicemen, and one of them is let down by a cable down into the water and is willing to help those who are struggling in the water to find help, the ones who are wounded, the ones who are weary, whatever, if they will just trust that serviceman in the water and will hold on to that life-saving cable, then there is hope for them to be lifted and to be rescued. In this case, the serviceman actually offers himself as a decoy, as a sacrifice to the monster lurking below so that the wounded and weary can be lifted to safety. And this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. His blood and his body are in the water too. And we're going to celebrate that in just a moment. His blood and his body are in the water too. And he delivered us, and in so doing, he destroyed the monster lurking below. The death of all deaths spelled the death of all deaths. What I've shared with you this morning is really the first part of the story. There's more to come this weekend. This weekend is not over. You need to hear the rest of the story. And so we encourage you, we'd love to have you come up to the Living Arts Center on Sunday at 10 a.m. downtown Mississauga. Come and be a part and find out the second part or the rest of the story with us as we celebrate Jesus this Easter. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we've been able to reflect upon Jesus and what he has accomplished for us. And we marvel that he was willing to sacrifice himself for us who are so unworthy. Thank you that he destroyed death. Thank you that he defeated the evil one. We're thankful that he has delivered us and forgiven us. And so we bless him and we worship him, our great God and Savior, our great mediator between us and you. We bless you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen.